expectation of eternal life. Number one, eternal life is central to regeneration. One without the other is impossible. But now in this whole discussion from here on to the end of the book, I, I wonder if we have gotten the drift of things. What is regeneration? What is I was wondering if I could illustrate it. I don't think I can. And I'm almost afraid to try because I'm afraid it will be a misconception. Let's see what we can do. There you are and there I am. One form or another. Now then, for you and for me to be regenerated. There is an act of God. All right? And that act, that act of God, in regeneration is the implanting of eternal life. Understand? Eternal life can almost be considered as the product of an act. Understand me? There's an act. The act of regeneration is the giving of eternal life. Now, the reason that we've got to pretty well understand that and hang on to it is because If there's anything that jeopardizes, jeopardizes the act of God or eternal life, that person is saved. Right. How can I, right here, that person, how can I affect eternal life? How can I do that? It's impossible, isn't it? And then immediately, don't you see the consequences of that rationale? Then man controls eternal life. I'm going back to not accepting that uh, fish is great. It's not working because of the failure of our sense. Man is not resisting great. Okay. But I'm not right. saying that the man is making a difference as far as he allows that catch of grace to work. Then the act takes place, it's not man doing it. God does the act. Yeah, all well, the efficacious grace and the act are absolutely simultaneous, aren't they? <laughs> you know, this is the reason that he, in your reading, you have come up against the declaration that uh, it's inscrutable. I can't understand how he does it. Can you? I can read what he does, and I believe it. Isn't that right? But I can't understand this business of how he, how he takes a life of the character of himself, and so makes it a part of you, 
and makes it a part of me, then I have eternal life from God. I don't understand all of that. I, it isn't the chemistry, is it? You can't put the thing in a test tube. And you can't work it out on a slide rule. It's a revelation of what he does. That's all it's doing. Now then he says, there are three figures of speech which represent the regenerating act of God which is a product of eternal life. And there's number two in your outline is spiritual birth. Now you you have read in your Bible and you, uh, for me uh, John chapter three, haven't you? And as the Lord told Nicodemus, you got to be born anew. That in itself, anothan, which means to be born from above. That, as we stated yesterday, is showing us the source, isn't it? It's something heavenly. And that, to me, boggles my mind. Well, I'm sure not a very heavenly person. And neither is he. We're just a bunch of depraved reprobates. Now, that isn't very flattering for our egos. But that's what we are. And how, 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 how in the world can a holy God condescend, condescend to bestow upon you and bestow upon me? Something that's pure, something that's eternal, something that's of the very character of God. Nothing. Well, once again, take down John 3 7, John 1 13, and James 1 18. of his own will he begat he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruit that he preaches. Psalm 37, John 1, 13, James 1, 18. So you have the figure as speak of the new birth. That represents the regenerative act of eternal life for you and for me. And boy, how new it is. It's so new, it's heavenly. Then, number three, another figure of speech, a spiritual resurrection. And he gives Romans 6.13, where it says, We're alive from the dead. Ephesians 2.5. Even though we were dead in trespass and sin, he's made us alive together with Christ. Made us alive. We were dead. Now we're alive. You see the figure of speech he's using? Now this, this figure of speech 
I, I, I want to caution you just a little bit. We take figures of speech a whole lot different than this. Uh, we will look at a couple. My what a handsome couple. We have a concept of what we mean by that term handsome couple. That's a figure of speech, isn't it? It's a figure of speech of a concept. Um, these figures of speech are spiritual verities. And when you talk about the new birth, when you talk about spiritual resurrection, you're talking about figures of speech that represent the supernatural. And number four, the new creation. New creation. Well, take down these two references. Ephesians 2.10. Four twenty four, Second Corinthians five seventeen. These are figures of speech that relate to regeneration, the imparting of eternal life. So when I have this eternal life, that eternal life is described for me as having a completely new birth. Now then, I'll never forget. I'll never forget when um, it's, it's, uh, Jimmy Carter was president of uh, the United States. He's, I think he was Southern Baptist man. And as far as I'm concerned, that was an unsaved family. His brother, he was called up over the carpet a number of times. He got a new beer going. And I'm not saying that's the characteristic of Southern Baptist. I'm saying that a whole lot of Southern Baptists who do things like that. The same as there are probably a whole lot of brethren that wouldn't stoop to do things like that too. Because I, I, know, I know of a brethren elder who used to live in St. Catharines whose motto was this. He was a broker in this case. And his motto was this. Fire beware. <laughs> for a broker, a real estate man, who is an elder, the leading elder of a brethren assembly, <laughs> he couldn't lay straight in bed, could he? <laughs> I, I, and I know of some very crooked people. Well, that is not conducive for the truth of the figure of speech that you're alive from the dead and that you have this wonderful new thing called the new creation. New creatures in Christ. And then number five, eternal life, eternal life from your point of view and my point of view is received by what? Faith. 
Let me just read something. Regeneration supplies eternal life. As justification and sanctification deal with the problem of sin specifically, it is a smashing blow to all philosophies which hold that man has inherent capacity for saving himself. Regeneration is holy of God. No possible human effort, however noble, can supply eternal life. The proper doctrine of regeneration gives to God all glory and power due His name. At the same time, it displays His abundant pr provision for a race dead in sin. Amen. The only area of human responsibility is to believe And that belief in itself. Believing in self. He gets in some things over here that's pretty hard for me to understand. But that act of believing itself uh, is a work of the Spirit of God in me, not on the heart of man, I trust Christ. Right and yet it's still applicable to the responsibility of a God created aspect of you and aspect of me, and that's my will. Okay, now, E in your outline. Regeneration accomplished by means. Regeneration, I should say, not accomplished by means. Number one. Let's retitle this. Biblical theology. Biblical theology holds to the view that all means are excluded. God's act of regeneration. Whereas we recognize the responsibility of man to believe, yet that responsibility that responsibility has nothing to do, absolutely nothing to do, with the act of regeneration. Number two. The human will is ineffectual. The human will is ineffectual. What do we mean by that? There's a little diagram up here. I have a will up there. Don't I? But that will is not effective in the act of God. Absolutely not. That's a God-created responsibility of mine. But the last statement he states is this. It is not that the human will is ruled aside, nor does it waive the human responsibility to believe. It is rather that regeneration is wholly a work of God in a believing man. Wholly a work of God. Regeneration is wholly a work of God in the believing heart. How can I illustrate that?
Okay. Let's start a car, shall we? The starting of that car is totally, is totally, totally the work of that angel. You're turning the switch. You're turning the switch. doesn't make that engine ignite that gas. The electrical makeup with that gas, that's what starts that car. Your will, your will to turn that key is ineffectual to the operation of that engine. You know? No. <laughs> that engine. Unless you turn the key. God's grace is in your heart. But it's God's word, not your belief. You see that? Now number three. Other means excluded. Since we understand now the nature and character of regeneration, the conclusion is that there are no means whatsoever in any shape or fashion or way that affects regeneration. It's an instantaneous act of God. F in your own mind. Regeneration, not experimental. And in this section here, number one, the experience follows regeneration. Since regeneration is an instantaneous act of God and not accomplished by means, Well, it simply follows that the act itself is not experimental, but the experience follows the act. Isn't that right? Regeneration itself is not subject to experience or analysis, but the supernatural instantaneous act of God. Now, a new, the new light may be a source of experience, but the act of regeneration itself is not experience. And it is. Regeneration is the source, isn't that right? Of new experience. How can you enjoy the spiritual life without having it? Hmm? And the life then becomes the source of all your spiritual experience. Number two, regeneration is not dependent upon experience. I think 
We just understand. Oh, you gotta feel sorry for your sins before you can get saved. You've got to. Uh, you gotta repent before you can be saved. Repentance is a part of, an inseparable part of. It. And I can tell a person the results of it. See. Right there in that middle. And that's holy ground. You can't trade them. I can't trade them. I don't care how many times you shake hands with them. I don't care how many times you pray with them. I don't care how many times you raise your hand. I don't care how many times you open up. Or anything else. How many times have you heard this? Any of you who want to get saved, come forward. Want to get saved, come forward. How ridiculous. Just that coming forward is a prerequisite to getting saved. Some people that feel that they're just God's little appointed messengers. It's a straight and they're worn out on this point. Well, I got very sick, so I said, you straighten some of us over here. I think about it. It's not too nice. It's here like Jay Vernon McGee is dead now. First week he came to Dallas Theological Seminary, fresh out of Bible school, he made an appointment with Dr. Dr. Lewis Perry Chaper to straighten Dr. Chaper out on predestination. Well, if you want to get saved, boys and girls, that's what you do to get saved. Now come on up and talk to me and join my crowd. And you can do it. Blind leading the body and both of them to the ditch. Then number three, regeneration inseparable from salvation. Well, he, he gives quite a discussion here with reference to this, and I don't think at this point we need to uh, spend a great deal of time. He does bring up a problem with the Lutherans with reference since, since regeneration is non-experimental, whether the Lutherans even go so far as to say, well, then since there is, since experience is ineffectual, uh, then babies can be saved too. They don't have to, uh, don't have to enter into a great understanding so they can be saved. Are babies saved? Not in, not in the sense of even having eternal life. I think babies are safe until we come to the age, whatever time it is, to the age of accountability. And should they die before that time, then I think the statement, then they're regenerated. So long as you understand what regeneration is, they're not. And my big argument with that is, for a second, send me to the Anyway, 
for David's way more died. He cannot come to the front of him. Okay, now G in your outline. The effect of regeneration. Now, in this section, he speaks of certain spiritual qualities. Certain spiritual qualities that belong to anyone and everyone who's regenerated. Now then, number one, the first spiritual quality that he mentions is a new nature. And I want you to take down a scripture reference here, which I like a little bit better than what he's mentioned here, in 2 Peter 1, 4. So I want to read that passage for me. Might be partakers of the divine nature. Now, kids, that statement there is anarchous. What does that mean? What does anarchous mean? Without the article. Anarchous means without the article. And when you have a structure without the article, you're not talking about identity. If I say, bring me the book, probably within the framework of the context of our discussion, you know what book I'm talking about, isn't it, right? But if I tell you to bring me a book, then I'm asking for an object that has the characteristic of a book. Isn't that right? That's what we have in this passage. It's an anarchist construction. Or so we become partakers of the divine nature? No. We become partakers of a divine nature. Showing not the identity, but I don't have God's nature. But I have a nature of the character and calendar. Okay? What's the difference? One difference is this. That if I had God's nature, that would make me God. But I'm not God. But I have a nature of the character and caliber of God which is a new life, the product of my father. Now along with that, and this is, I can understand this, but this is true. I not only have a new nature, but I have an old sin nature, isn't that right? Sure. Absolutely. So, this is what causes me then to have such a drastic change in my attitude and in my life is because I have a different nature than I used to have. Now that old nature is still latent and very, very, very powerful because that old nature is fueled by a very wicked spirit. by the temptations of this world and by a flesh that's totally sinful. 
Now the new nature, the new nature that I had in itself does not have a capacity to force me to live sinless. But it is of such a nature and it is of such a character that when yielded to the Spirit of God, I as a person yield to the Spirit of God, then I'm able to live that way to life. Well, we'll have to quit there. We'll finish up. And now for Tuesday, you are to read the baptism of the Holy Spirit.